safety and risk management and all that sort of thing. Is that right, Faith? Uh, yes, that's exactly what I do. So tell us, tell us some things, some examples of, you know, what you've what you've seen in the workplace that horrifies you or would horrify anyone, but also seeing that people don't understand something until something goes wrong and then they see it, but they don't see it beforehand to prevent it in the first place. Yeah. So what I'll start off with is basically is with regards to um, customization, why it's important. So when I started my business, a lot of uh, clients would call me in and they would be trying to ensure safety in the workplace. And they do this by maybe purchasing work health and safety manuals. Uh, they do all the safety training they possibly could. And at the end of the day, they'd still be sitting there and saying, well, I'm still stuck. I don't know how to take this further. And what I would find is that a lot of the time they would, would have manuals that actually are not addressing the risk within that business. And it's specific to every business, isn't it? It's absolutely specific to every business because even if you, you know, both uh, in the same type of business, but there's always, every one of them is unique. Yeah. And, uh, give us some examples of what you would do. Let's say you're in a retail outlet. What is the risk for the employer, the employees and the customers? And they'd be all different. Yes, they all different. They differ. But at the end of the day, it still goes back to, you know, this basic um, principles, safety principles that need to be followed. Like, I mean, you're talking about training stuff, you're talking about safe systems of work. So even if you're looking at the procedure, you know, if you're in a mechanic shop, it's quite different to if you're in a retail position because they're two different environments. So then you'd be actually, when you're working with the in mechanic, you're then looking at what work activity are you doing and what risks are involved in that. And this is when you would then be able to develop a, a procedure, a safe work procedure or safe operation procedure that actually can help them mitigate that risk. And in the same way, you go to the retail, the retailer, and in that retail area, you know, there are risks when, you know, they're talking to clients. Uh, we know that even like now, you know, you get abusive clients, uh, you get armed robbery, you get all those sort of things. So you have to sort of, uh, when you are working with a client, you've got to actually look at what risks are involved in that particular workplace or that work activity. Okay. So let me ask you here. I mean, yes, they have to be aware of it. <clears throat> Excuse me. And they need to know what to do when a situation happens. But it's something that they don't really think about until such time that something happens. And then the emotions take over and they can actually forget about what they need to do. If they're not trained properly in the first place, they can mess it all up. Yes. Yes. So, so that you, training is vital. The yes. proper training is vital. Yes. So basically, when when I'm when I'm going to workplace, and if if that particular employee does that particular task, that particular uh, employee will participate or they'll represent the group they'll participate in that session in the consultation session where we're developing that procedure so they have input I have input so I can highlight other risks where they will highlight other risks so be, between the two of us 
we can then come to that point where we actually ensuring that we uh, looking at all possible risks. And then once we develop that procedure, it's then taken back to the work group and we, they, they are there, we consult with them and then they go through the process of looking at it and between the group, maybe some other, other workers might, hi might hi highlight other risks involved. So we try and get them all involved because each one will understand or each one would have identified different risks within that um, maybe work activity or whether they're dealing, working with a particular type of equipment or whatever it might be. And then as a group, we can educate them. I'm just thinking about in the retail situations when you have someone who dresses the windows, then you have retail staff that actually put the things on the the racks and the shelves and all that sort of thing and sometimes there's preparation when they're putting you know clothing or things in the windows that need to be steamed so there'd be a procedure for using the steamer where it's positioned in the store and to look out for customers walking past the steamer if the store isn't big enough what's the risk here so you have to be on the ball all the time. Yes, you definitely have to be on the ball. So, you know, there's two ways we deal with this, okay? We look specifically at the procedure. When you are using the steamer, these, these are the, the steps you need to take to ensure safety. And then you might look at, okay, now your work environment, you know, where are you doing it? So we'll have a look at, where they where they work in that area and as you said are they passer buyers there you know what is what is the um, what are the risks are involved are they slip trip falls are they you know we look at all of that so then again you educate them around that you need to know you make sure you manage that side of it so when you educate and particularly the good part is when you have that one-on-one -on -one with with the with the workers it's surprising how they begin to understand and they begin to, you know, they, they come up now, oh, there's this risk, there's this risk, there's this other risk. So they, 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 they then are forthcoming. So your communication with them is so important because as I said, one of my USPs is that I mentor and coach. I give them understanding of the process. And when the workers start now, you know, identifying different risks and things like that, and you can see everything now that when they understand and they start telling you about all these other things or other experiences they've had that they've thought was risky or where they are suggesting another procedure for it. So that's when you know they've got that understanding now, you know, and they can apply it in their workplace. Mm -hmm. But what happens is if you don't go in there and have those conversations, they're not really thinking about the risks that are involved until they're all pointed out. They don't really, they might see some of them, but they don't see all of them. And that you're, you're, you're the person that goes into the retail, play, you know, organisation, store, whatever it might be. And you have, as you say, those individual conversations with the staff, the, you know, the employer, so that they all understand how many risks they're actually juggling mm. because there they can be a hell of a lot of them and particularly yeah. in a retail outlet I mean you can know you can walk in you can slip over you can um, you, you can be trying something on and something may happen you might fall over you might get lightheaded I, I don't know there's there could be all sorts of possibilities as you said but it's making the staff and the owner aware of this to prevent as much as possible. Yeah. And it's really getting them on board with safety. Mm. And, and it's, reducing, it's reducing the cost of workers' compensation. It's re reducing the loss of time that a staff member's off it's reducing so many different things. 
and I, you said something to me really early on in our conversation about on cost. It's not just workers' compensation. If something happens, what other costs are involved? So let's assume that there is a significant workplace injury. So that's when work cover will they get, you know, through the insurer, work covers also get that gets that information. So that will be a red flag to say, look, we need to go and go to this workplace because this sounds like they're not managing or mitigating risk effectively. So once it becomes a legal matter, then that means it just that's where the cost for the organization can blow up because it means that if if the insurer says they're not non-compliant, sorry, if the re-regulator says they're non-compliant, it means that there's that possibility of fines. Ooh, and if how heavy are those fines? Exactly. And, and if that worker's injured to the extent where they've got permanent disability and there's negligence, it means that that worker can then, it can go to common law. So as long as they are, the, the, the workplace is deemed negligent, that worker can take it one step further to, to, to sue the, org, the, the business or the organization for, for, for the, the workplace injury or workplace accident. Well, it, it, it gets really scary when you say it like that. It's, it's not just they have time off for workers' compensation, but there's all this other stuff that can happen in the background. And if there's a permanent injury, and that person can't go back to work at all, then, you know, that's uh, an interesting situation for both the employer and the employee. And there's a lot of things to be considered there. There's the mental health of the injured person. There's the mental health and stresses of the employer of that organisation to know that the costs are blowing out, they could go broke. Yes, they can. And, you know, you were talking about fines, you know. Uh, you know, when the Work Health and Safety uh, Act came into place in 2011 and, and was in, 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 enacted in 2012, they, they introduced maximum fines. So I'll talk about New South Wales. So the basic fine for any workplace was something like 82,500. However, that was for, actually that was for directors, 82,500. And then when once the, uh, the act came into place, it increased to 600,000. Oh, and a, individuals, mm, and individuals was 300,000. So it increased to 600,000 for the overall organization? Uh, for the individual, for the director. Sorry, I'm, I made a mistake. Basically, 82,500 was the fine that directors would have. Right. But then once that legislation was passed, it increased where the director would be charged, his maximum fine, the maximum fine would be 600,000 for the director. Individuals would be 300,000 thousand dollars as well so half of that so each person can be fined the director and everyone that's involved can be fined that is responsible for that workplace yes and then the the, wow. the, the organization it was a three million but remember that was in 2012 it has since increased <laughs> so for a director i think it's just over seven hundred thousand uh, an individual is, um, I think it's 350000 And for a workplace, for the organization, I think it's over $3.5 So there's one, two, three different fines there, and they, they cop the lot. Wow. Yes. That could put someone right out of business. Absolutely. And that if you're is... Looking, and if you're looking at the, you know, if, if oh. you uh, six hundred thousand, that's the cost of your home. That 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 the the the, the scary stuff. <laughs> it is. Wow! Don't employ anyone. Shut your shops. <laughs> 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 oh, 
or make sure that your safety management is in place. You're doing all the right things. If there is an incident, you've done everything to prevent it, but sometimes you can't prevent that injury. And so would the fines be the same or would they be different if they are proven competent in all areas? So I'll go back a little bit. You said something earlier. So what they ask you to do is do everything that's that human is possible, reasonable mm -hmm. and practicable because you just said that they probably can't do everything to prevent that injury. Mm -hmm. But they will they'll need to prove that you've done everything that is reasonable and practicable. Mm -hmm. And again, there are different categories of fines, just depending on the situation. Oh, that so just we were makes... just talking about maximum fines. Ah, that just makes my stomach churn. I'm thinking, wow, you know, people go into the supermarkets and they slip over if there's a wet floor. What sort of compensation do they have to pay? Who's responsible? Is it the overall director, the directors? um the owners yeah you know, yeah and oh, that that's actually mind-boggling what yeah. about yeah what about a a one-person retail outlet someone who's working in a retail outlet a boutique or something like that they would have to have their safety management in place but the only person that they need to concern themselves is them what if they have an accident? They go out and work as compensation. Their business closes. Do they still get fined? You know, that's an interesting question because often I get lots of people sort of saying, well, you know, it's just me in the business. But let's look at that retailer. That retailer is okay. having clientele. Yes. Okay. Now we've got to, we've got to stop it here because we've got to go to the news. 